think we're live. Yep. I think we're live. Let me let me let me check real quick. Yeah. Yep, we are live. Can hear you chomping away, bro. That thing <laughs> make, it, it sounds delicious, man. It sounds delicious. What is that? Shrimp chips. Maui. Oh, yeah. That bugger is unbelievable. What's up, everybody? I see we are live on Facebook. That's a good thing. That is a good thing. Yeah. How are you guys doing? It is Thursday already, man. Another week almost gone. Mm. Almost gone. Another right. week. Another week, man. It's been, uh, it's, these weeks are going by quickly. It, it's going to be Christmas pretty soon. Appreciate you guys all joining in. Tell us where you're coming from. We'll the chat up once, once the, uh, mm. once our guest, Dr. Lee Altenberg, will be on tonight. You've seen him on the news the last few nights. And uh, we're going to have him to ourselves tonight for a whole hour. No, Konishki is on next week. Next week, Friday. Nest mm -hmm. Nestor Garcia, what's up, man? Put in where you're coming from, where, you are, where you're at right now. I see Pahoa. I see... Hilo? Pahoa from Big... Uh, Big, okay. Big Island, I'm assuming. Hilo? Kailua? Lahaina. 96734. That was my address for a while. Lahaina, Hilo. <laughs> Charlie, yes, you're going to make me hungry. <laughs> yes, here you go. Charlie, you're going to make Mama. me hungry. Lahaina. All right. Hilo. Waipahu. We got Waipahu. Oh, now, now, my brother Brian, all the way from Ho'o, now, now. Kihei, Wailuku, Oahu, Kailua Kona, Waimea Kawaii. Alyssa Andrews is from our truck. <laughs> Koloa. Sorry, guys. I'm looking down because I'm looking at the comments. Actually, I, should, I can look up, actually. It's here on my phone. My phone is trailing by about 10 seconds, I think. So, But anyway, hello, you guys. Thank you for joining us again tonight. Dr. Lee Altenberg will be in the house talking to us about the Lancet study, which at one time, Charlie, we mm -hmm. thought, I think most people that had half a brain thought, that when the Lancet study came out, that would have been used as kind of the foundation to formulate or improve the unsafe travel pro. I, I cannot call it the safe travel program. I'm sorry. It's the unsafe travel program. But anyway, um, we're still coming in. Moana Lua, Kalaheo. Nestor Garcia is in Waipahu, too. All right. Waiakea Uka, Kailua. All right. But anyway, we thought that that was going to be used as the as the baseline, as the guideline, as the blueprint, but <laughs> it went completely ignored. And well, um, you know, let me say this, just from experience, and maybe you can expound upon it when I, when I spit it out there. You know, in order for any of these plans to work, it has you have to have all facets of the plan airtight. There's no way of getting around it, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not. You you have probably the one of the most strictest ports of call, which is probably Lihui, because we are very strict in what we do, because that's what we were mandated to do. But the other some of the other airports don't. And we know that for a fact as well. So I don't care how it's played out, if there's Pukas. A plan is only as good when all the links are connected. But the links are not connected, it will not work. And I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I think tonight our viewers are going to be uh, are in for a treat because you will get the cold hard facts. You're going to get data coming out of the University of Hawaii as well as the Lancet study. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it'll be clear. If it's not clear to you now, which I'm sure it is, but if it's not, it will be clear to you later on. And Dr. Altenberg, listen, he doesn't have any dog in this fight other than his his passion for numbers. <laughs> He's like a mm -hmm. biologist, but a mathematician. He works with the UH research place where they do, they do all these modeling. 
So you'll see it tonight. Um, and I do have a couple of video clips that we'll play, very short videos, just to bring everybody up to speed uh, before we, we get Altenberg on. But, you know, I got I tell you, Charlie, we, we are blessed. Um, this show is blessed to have this caliber of, of, of guests on that are willing to come on and share uh, because they want to help. And, you know, when they go on the news, they might have two minutes. They might have three minutes. You know, they may interview for it a half an hour, or an hour. But, yep. you know, by the time they edit out all the stuff and they end up with maybe a sentence or two, well, tonight we'll be able to uh, hear hear the whole thing. And, and, in fact, hopefully even have some time for some questions. But I think the bottom line is this. Uh, this state has constantly ignored the fact. Did you remember to do your intro? Golly. Selena. Thank you, Selena. Thank you. Hang on. Charlie, fasten your seatbelt. Thank you, Selena. I did forget. I did. I am so excited. I am so excited because uh, we're going to hear some good info tonight. So, Uncle Charlie, there's a question. I know. I'm sorry. Tonight I am feasting. That's a good friend, um, uh, Rene Moraoka. I have from some Maui-style potato chips. Mm -mm -mm -mm, good. And you know when uh, you're just too lazy to drive to LA, LA McDonald's, a little of this and a little dab of ketchup, you think you're eating French fries. <laughs> and that's how you get away with certain things. <laughs> but thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. Sounds freaking delicious. That's all I got mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. Sounds sounds just delicious, man. Hey, guys. Um. Some of you are watching on YouTube. I know a lot of you just uh, are here on, on Facebook. But on YouTube, go to my channel on YouTube. There is every single episode that we've ever had on my YouTube channel. Every single one of them. In, even the impromptus are on there. So um, go to my YouTube channel. And here, I'm going to put this up just because I like. Hang on. Fasten your seatbelt. Damn, I'm getting I'm getting better, bro. I am getting better. <laughs> so go to my face uh, YouTube channel. It's Mel Raposo. Don't forget to subscribe so you get notified. Hit the bell icon right next to the subscribe button. Uh, you get notified every time we upload a video, whether it's a Facebook from a Facebook Live or anyone. <laughs> Charlie's still impressed. I can see it in his eyes. Hey, you know, you know, um, last this week, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, when Al when Dr. Altenberg first came on the news to talk about this, this this Lancet study, you know what was interesting is right after Dr. Altenberg spoke, they they interviewed Dr. Dara O'Carroll. Right after Dr. Altenberg, same story. Dr. Alt uh, Dr. Altenberg was followed by Dr. Dara O'Carroll, and guess what? Tomorrow night we got Dr. Dara O'Carroll coming on, so we're gonna get a back to back, boom boom one two combo. To wrap up the week and uh it's going to be a powerful powerful two nights for you guys appreciate you guys joining us i really do man i really appreciate you guys um oh hang on here's an announcement public service announcement public service announcement hold on here oh this is nice this is nice i just gonna put up some nice stuff because i like i like feel good charlie for bringing, thank you, Mel and Charlie, uh, Mel and Uncle Charlie, for bringing all these doctors and experts on the show. We owe it all to you. You know, listen, guys, you, it's because of you folks. I can promise you, if it was just me and Uncle Charlie on here and there were no viewers, I would have a hard time believing that we they would come on. They wouldn't come on if they was just talking to me and Charlie. So here's, here's a public service announcement. Ho'omana is doing another outreach tomorrow for the houseless. Two, 2 to 5, 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Um, I have no idea where. I'm assuming it's at Ho'omana again. Any questions, call Ho'omana at 808-821-2818. Please, please, please spread that word, guys. Spread the word. Rana doing good work. 
and her group doing good work for the homeless houseless appreciate you Ro. and um 808-821-2818 spread the word guys hold on right across coco palms on the kuomo road side thank you very much Ro, for that um i'm just gonna toss up until we get dr altenberg on Kawhi is the only correct numbers. Labs are backed up. Cases have not gone down. I I, I do want to say that um, I, I watch the news and I hear, you know, we're doing much better. Well, you know, if you're looking at only the numbers, we are doing. If we're only looking at cases, we are doing much better. If we're looking at hospitalizations, we are. But you got to think about one thing. Today, we had 12 more deaths. Yesterday, we had 12 deaths. In the last week, I think last couple of weeks, week and a half or so, we had over 100 deaths. So, when someone dies, guess what opens up? A hospital bid. So I get insulted when I hear our lieutenant governor or any of our elected officials come out and try to convince us how good we're doing when 12 people dying a day? No, 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 no. That's not good. That's not good. And I, I would think that they would be concerned about that, but it's not. In fact, in a, in a lieutenant governor's tweet this morning, he doesn't even mention the deaths. He talks about the hospitalizations and how it has dropped in the last two weeks, the percentage. But no mention of 12 people losing their lives, 12 families this devastated tonight. So, guys, let's, let's, let's treat this virus with the respect that I, I hate to say it deserves, but it does. It deserves our respect, and we need to be, make sure that we understand how dangerous this thing is. 12 deaths. Well, you know, there's, there's, there's so, I, I remember we had one guest on and they said, you know, whatever data is put out there, you just really got to know what the data means. And, you know, death always represents finality, right? There's nothing beyond death. Death is... And the question will always remain, you know, how did the person get there? Uh, how how big of a role did COVID play in it? Did it accelerate? You know, there's there's so many things. And uh, I, I would like to say, first of all, condolences to all the families that lost a loved one. Because in this day and age, with the technology that we have, the science that we have, we shouldn't be losing people to this dreaded disease. But something happened. There was a break uh, in the defenses that allowed this uh, terrible, terrible virus to creep in. And, you know, uh, you know I, I did a post earlier today, and that post said that, you know, I wish uh, there, there are going to be those that choose not to get vaccinated, and I, and I respect their decision. But I also asked them if it's possible to please put out the word that all people are not like you, the one who's giving that message because <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> you will get some individuals that think hey if they ain't vaccinated and nothing happened to them well that that i guess i can follow in their footsteps because nothing's gonna happen to me and you're sadly mistaken because their genetic makeup might be totally different from yours and that's why they're not getting infected as bad as what you may expect it but you may get tagged by it and boy, oh boy, you may not have the resilience like they do. And then what? It will be too late to call for help. That's, that's, that's the message that I've been preaching. That's why I use the word tag. You get tagged by this thing. You remember when you're growing up, you play uh, uh, Chase Master? Once you get tagged, you out. You got to try to stay so far ahead of this thing that you don't get tagged at all. Because... If you're, if you're the gambling type, then you can just say, okay, let's see how long you can go without anything happening to you. And that's perfectly fine because that's your decision. What I'm saying is, what if something goes terribly wrong? Do you expect everybody to drop what they're doing to take care of you? What we've been saying all along is when the hospital beds are to capacity, what if there is no room for you? Then what do you do? That's what I've been saying. That's what I've been saying. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I, I think Dr. Char made it very clear that, you know, we're not out of the woods. That, that Again, that's the conflicting messages, the mixed messages you get, because when you listen to the morning news and you hear, you know, the LG talk about how we're, you know, he wants to, he wants to open up. He wants to, he's, he's wants to open up. He wants to, that's what he wants to do. And I do too. I, I mean, do you think I enjoy this? I hate this. I hate this COVID nonsense. I'm, mm-hmm. COVID fatigue is an understatement, but huh, I don't like seeing my friends die. I don't like seeing 12 people die every day. I, I, I don't. And I, I saw someone make a comment today. How come they don't post the flu numbers like they do the COVID? Because we're not in a flu pandemic, people. We're not in a flu pandemic. Um, it, it's It's... I, I'm, I just don't get it, um, but anyway, we'll, we'll we'll get a good good education tonight as far as uh, what we can do to what what's available, what options are available that we simply choose not to follow, but what options are available for our state to to do, and we've heard it from uh, experts from around the world, around the country, that we you got to protect your borders, you got to protect, you got to stop, you got to stop. Uh, new virus from coming in mm. um, and and yep. that is i think what tonight's yep. um, session is all about it's you know there is an opportunity the bottom line is this we know that travel is bringing in the virus we know and we also know and and, and you'll see it tonight you'll also see that the this unsafe travel program is not stopping it in fact it's it's very very weak against the influx of new virus so We'll, we'll, we'll see. I'm not sure where doctor. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run the, because it is 7 o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and run the video, Charlie. Yes. Yes, go right ahead. Uh, and then we'll, then hopefully by the time it's done, we will um, have Dr. Altenberg on. Jerry. Well, the state is seeing its biggest jump in travelers since the pandemic began. About 20,000 folks arriving across the islands daily. But with COVID cases on the rise again, some are wondering how and if travelers are bringing the virus in with the safe travel program in place. Nikki Schenfeld reports. As more people start flying again, a new study out of UC San Francisco found that COVID testing similar to Hawaii's Safe Travels program could catch nearly 90% of infected travelers before they board the plane. A recent study by the Lancet Infectious Disease Journal wanted to give struggling airlines and states an idea of how people can travel safely during a pandemic. The main thrust of the study is that when you do a pre-test uh, program and you have a window of three days before travel, you can reduce the amount of disease significantly that would travel. Assuming 100,000 travelers are infected at any given day, before, during, and after their trip, the study used computer models and simulations based on things like daily case numbers, testing, U.S. regions, and how long someone could be infected for. Each strategy was run 3,000 times. The study did not use Hawaii Safe Travels data, but still found that PCR testing three days before a flight or rapid testing the day of a flight reduced the number of infectious travelers by 88%. Yes, up to 12% of people might not be captured uh, because they are still incubating their disease or the test just doesn't catch it. But the other 88%, it catches and they don't travel. Green says the study backs Hawaii's program, which shows few cases have slipped through since reopening in October. He says without safe travels in place, Hawaii would have remained closed to tourism until June of this year. You know, and and that was never a possible reality for us. We would have had widespread economic devastation. And so the reason I pushed so hard for the safe travels program last summer was I knew that we couldn't survive as a... uh, as a state, if we didn't have some kind of program, we literally would not have survived. You would have seen tens of thousands of people leaving Hawaii. This week, Hawaii welcomed its two millionth visitor since safe travels began. For now, though, Green says the safe travels program is here to stay. I think that the, the key landmarks are sometime in May, we have the vaccination passport. We continue to do safe travels through the summer. We ourselves are safe because we vaccinated most of our population uh, by July 4th. And then come fall, you'll see the numbers be so low across the country that we won't worry so much. And I would expect 
that we can propose to back off of any restrictions. Nikki Schoenfeld, KHO on 2 News, working for Hawaii. There you have it. Um, that was, um, and, and, and tonight we'll, we'll talk about that Lancet study. We'll, we'll talk about that Lancet study that, that um, Gina Mangiardi, uh, Mangiardi talked about. But you see the numbers, you see the, the, the predictions. Just remember, that, that thing aired back in March, and the predictions were way off because it's not science-based, right? It's, it's not science-based at all. It's, it's based on politics. It's based on, uh, you know, preaching to your, your uh, special interest groups and sh letting them know that you're doing all you can to, to help them. But it was not based on science. It was not based on data. It was not based on, on facts. And, and I think uh, I saw Dr. Uh, Altenberg just texted me that he was booting up. So he should be on any moment now. But what, Charlie, what do you, what do you thought about that, that segment? Again, back in March, a lot yeah. has changed since then. Yeah. A lot of things happen. But for someone who actually works the airports now, you can see my face, right? So I say no more. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna say any more because, you know, I've, I think at my age, I've, and being having, enjoyed a career in police work, you know when, you've been subjected to hogwash. And so. Uh, again, again, the norm, the numbers don't lie, right? I mean, right. when we opened up. When we opened it up, when we put the passport in place, when we stopped the pre-flight testing and the post-arrival testing, it pretty pretty clear what happened, and that there is no dispute. Mm -hmm. um, that that is that is the fact. That is exactly what what we saw. The spikes started right after that. Uh, and you know what 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 becomes yeah. bothersome? The question always becomes bothersome. Okay, is who does the enforcement? You gotta have a real good enforcement program to keep things in check. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. One of the viewers said, so if that's the case, then why are they crying the blues needing uh, more screeners at the airport, right? They're willing to pay them three to $400 a month incentive, right? For more screeners at the Honolulu, not Honolulu airport, but Honolulu as one of the airports, but for every airport throughout the state. And if you're interested, sign up with Roberts Hawaii. But the question is, you know, w why is it? I understand that many of the screeners before went back to their regular jobs. But nonetheless, that means that if you're asking for more screeners now, that they must have had some break in the system somewhere along the line. And that's just that hum and, and it, it kind of coincides with the increase in numbers, right? That these numbers climbed so rapidly. And now you ask for more screeners. You should have asked for them in the beginning. Not wait till we got saturated with the darn thing. Yeah. They're they're saying they're anticipating they're anticipating the uh the rush, the winter rush. But this is what this is this is what my mm -hmm. problem with the is. increase in numbers, right? right. Hey, Doc. Aloha. We have some technical difficulties here. This is new. This is not Zoom. Yeah, we yeah we came on with a new platform only because with the new platform, I get to um, tell the people who you are. It's pretty cool. And we got a little fancy stuff. We just played the video, Doc. But before, I just wanted to make one comment about those screeners. They're offering three to $400 bonuses a month because they're trying to entice people. You know what? You know who deserves the, the nurses? The doctors, the frontline workers that haven't stopped working from day one. It's funny how all these incentives are for people that either weren't working or were staying home. All the people that's been working from day one on the front line in front of COVID patients, risking their lives every single day, they don't get no bonuses. They don't get no incentives. I just I just wanted to make that point. I don't want to take any more time because this is action packed. Doc, we did just play the video, the K two N video from back in March. Um, explaining the, uh, with the lieutenant governor talking about the ninety percent capture rate and the fact that yeah. So we have all seen you on the news in the last couple of nights about this Lancet study. So uh, I also have another clip, Doc, of you in recent 
uh, on a recent. Do you want me to play that now, or you want me to? Well, I'll, I'll, let me tell the story of what happened in between. Okay. Now, can, right. can you hear me? Okay. Let's do that. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay. Oh, it's got fancy Zoom capabilities and all this stuff. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so you heard the very optimistic uh, prediction that uh, things would basically be over by now, and uh, in the pandemic. But the the key thing was this um, the statement that there was ninety percent. Uh, cases could be prevented from travelers infecting residents uh, by this pre-travel test. So um, it, I'm curious, uh, Mel or Charlie, when you heard that again, what uh, did, did you have any thoughts that came to mind? Let me just say, because there's women and children watching, I'm going to reserve my comments. Um, <laughs> Char <laughs> Char <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I, 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 listen, I'm not surprised because when he said it back in March, because of people like yourself and all the other guests that we've had on our show, I knew that, that it was not going to be true. That, let's just say that. Okay. So when I saw that, so I was actually, I was on Facebook and I saw somebody posted about this, um, about that headline. And I said, 90% are caught by this pretest. This can't be based on what else I had already read. And so part of what I'd read was a collection of references uh, that were put into an article by Dr. Dara O'Carroll, who's been on this show, yes? And um, so, and that was talking about how, how the high rate of false negative tests there were in detecting COVID during the first days after infection. And so you don't really start to pick it up until like six days after originally getting infected. So, uh, and then uh, it was only like 10 or 10 to 14 days that the person remains contagious. So that the, the idea that the test was stopping 90% of people, of, of infected people from getting on the plane didn't make any sense. So, um, so, you know, I like to make sense of the world. And that's perhaps the main thing that drives me as a scientist is when something doesn't make sense, I say, wait a minute, what's going on here? And I, and I dig into it. So, um, so I uh, looked at the, the study, the Lancet study that was referred to in the article and, and I'm reading it and it's not 90%. So what the what the ninety percent well, that was eighty eight percent, and that referred to how much reduction the pretest did of people that would be contagious on the plane on the day of travel. All right, so you take the the pretest in the three days before your flight, and that's going to stop eighty eight percent of the people who would be contagious on the airplane from getting on the airplane. So it's really, that's really good news in terms of what the pretest is doing to protect people on the flight coming to Hawaii. And um, so, but when the, the, the authors of the study, they, what they did is they, all right, so there's no good data on exactly how many infectious, infected people are getting on airplanes. So what they did is they just took all the data that they had available, all the other studies on the uh, how uh, sensitive the PCR test was and how uh, the course of the infection after getting exposed and they put all the the known data together and then they did this computer simulation to figure out what is the strategy of this pretest going to do in terms of uh, preventing the import of infection and so what they saw was all right so 88 percent reduction of contagious people on the day on the day of travel on the airplane but once they land get off the airplane and go into their destination then they start to come out of out of uh, incubation come out of latency because the virus you know gets in there so it's a few just a few, small number of little viruses they get into the cells and they start replicating and then they get out, burst out of the cells, and they go into the next cells, and they start replicating. So it's exponential growth starting from an extremely small amount. 
and basically just what you breathe in of this virus. And so it takes a while, uh, it takes like uh, on an average of six days on the old coronavirus strains, it takes six days before it bursts forth. So if you remember Alien, uh, when the, the, the astronaut is uh, back at breakfast and, uh, and the, the alien has let go of his face and everything seems to be fine, but then this alien bursts out of his chest. Well, that's the, the virus when you're coming out of latency uh, after you've been infected. So the old variant took about six days. The Delta variant takes only about four days. We'll talk about that later, but. Okay, so when, they, when the Lancet study looked at what's gonna happen once the tourist or the, the traveler has arrived at the destination, then they start to become contagious. And so what they did is they counted the total amount of, of uh, days that they were contagious and they just added them up. And then they, they calculated that the, the, um, the pretest was reducing the total exposure of the resident population of us here in Hawaii to, uh, to, to the virus by only 36%. So not 88%. 88% is just the day of travel on the airplane. But when you look at the total exposure over the whole over, say, 14 days, then um, the pretest was reducing that exposure by only 36%. So this is very different and, and not the story that was in the press. So I, I said, wait a minute. Uh, you know, I, I sent a note to um, Kahan 2 about uh, the error in their headline and it gave the correction and they never responded and that headline is still there you just saw it today I'm just uh, mel and charlie displayed it <clears throat> so that headline is uncorrected and uh then i i posted uh, on the lieutenant governor's site the same thing and um and he responded he said uh you know that the 88 percent is infectious travelers and the 36% is infectious days. And he said, read the paper carefully. Okay, so I had read the paper carefully. And so that was that was as far as I got in trying to correct it on that end. So, um, so that's anyway, let me let me see if you have any questions so far. Please interrupt at any time. Oh, there's a, okay, there's, oh, I gotta get, I gotta get hip to this new format. So in other words, you don't have the virus on the day of testing. Three to six days later, you're, yes, you are infectious or sick, correct, that's right. So the, the, the doctor, doctor, for some reason, your, your audio is trailing the video by a little bit, so not a problem, um, it's coming out clear. So I know the viewers are, it's like, it's like a, yeah, it's like, I'm not gonna even see a racial thing, but it's, you know how the, karate the old kung fu movies in the old days where the lips would move and then the voice would follow but anyway um yeah so in other words you don't have enough virus on day of the testing but three to six days later you're infectious or sick is that correct exactly right yeah and so 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 all these people got on the plane and you know they're sitting next to you they're infected but they're not yet contagious so that's good <clears throat> The people that would have been contagious, only 12% of them have gotten through. But once they land, once they're out in the shops uh, of Wailea or you know wherever they are going to, then they start to become contagious. And so the, this, the authors, they did a, they looked at simulated a second strategy where you have a five day quarantine and you get out of the quarantine with a second PCR test. And then they found that strategy reduced the exposure <clears throat> of the destination population by 70%. So that's much better. And, and that, um, so that, and they argue, <clears throat> if, you're, if you're only concerned about protecting people on the airplane, then the pretest is pretty good. But if you wanna protect the destination population, then you need to do some combination of quarantine and testing after they arrive. So that was 
So that was the, the real result of the Lancet study and not the one that was in the press here locally. And so I, you know, so I've taken some efforts to try to get the word about what the Lancet study actually said. I'm trying to get that into the into the popular press, and, and I'm grateful, Mel and Charlie, for you having me on the show in the, in the past and, uh, and, and talking about this. So, but here's the new development. As I said, if something doesn't make sense, it bugs me, and I got to figure out what's going on. And as I was reading the Lancet study. One of the things that didn't make sense was when they're counting the total amount of exposure from untested passengers, they started counting that in the three days before they even got on the plane. So all that exposure that the authors were counting isn't going to be exposing the destination population. Right? It's not going to be exposing us. So um, that so that what they were, ta the number that they were tallying up, that 36%, wasn't really representing the exposure to the destination population, to the residents of Hawaii. So I took the graphics of the, of the, um, of the article, and <clears throat> so tell me, can I share, can I share anything? Can I share a screen? I believe you can, Doc. Why don't you go ahead and try? I think, I, I believe you can. It says share screen button has an X through it. <coughs> Go ahead and try. Let me see here. Okay. I'm sorry I didn't get things set up for this new platform, but uh, let's see here. Yep, there it is. Ooh. This thing is so cool. Oh, no. Or right, now, but this... I want to share this. All right. Okay, All right. Go ahead and okay. share which, okay, with this one here. All right, is that the one? Yeah. Now, can you see this, uh, the slides? Okay, ready? Yeah. So, do you see the, the, the slide with the title? Yep. Okay, so. So here was that March 22nd story that Mel and Charlie played before I came on. And so here's this, why the 88% prevention was a surprise because it didn't fit in with the prior notions. So here's the, here's the study itself. So this is in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, a journal out of England. It's a very prestigious journal about infectious diseases. And now, can you see my little hand here moving? Yep. The cursor. Okay, so this first curve is the total exposure after the pretest. Or excuse me, the total exposure starting three days before travel. And this first figure is of untested, unquarantined travelers. And uh, let me blow this up. So this is no testing. So starting three days before, there's more and more exposure coming from them. And finally, at about, <clears throat> this is in the last like 10, 10, to, 10 to 14 days, it flattens out. There's not much exposure coming from people then. So then they compared that with this PCR test three days before departure. So here's our safe travels protocol. So it catches all these people that would be um, exposing others and it, the number that passed the test, that tested negative, that are contagious, by the day of travel, it's really, really small. See that, it's very small. So getting on the plane, mo most of all this, all this contagion here is prevented. And but then after they arrive, then the numbers start to go up and the exposure goes up. And so what they did is they looked at the height of this curve, which is the total number of days of exposure from the travelers. And they compared it to this curve, all right, which is the untested traveler just arriving as people always did. And this, they found that this was 36% lower than this. So that's where they got that 36% figure. But the problem is that this, all this was being counted 
all right? And it shouldn't have been counted because this wasn't exposing the destination population. And so this didn't make sense to me. And I wrote the authors and um, you know, they, they said, well, that's just what we were counting. And but that wasn't the only thing I noticed that didn't make sense. Right, so look over here at strategy. This is our second strategy. This is a PCR test like our safe travels, but then it's followed by a five-day quarantine and then a second test to get a quarantine. So this is much lower. And when they looked at how high this was, this was a 70% reduction from the test over here. But I was curious because it, it looks like these curves look the same, right? So this first five days here, the traveler is supposed to be in quarantine. They shouldn't be exposing anybody. So this number, this line should not be going up because nobody's getting exposed when the traveler is in quarantine. So this didn't make sense either. So I went and I took these uh, diagrams and I played around with them. And I, using a graphical program, I overlaid them on top of each other and I took the top curve, which is the no testing curve, and I shifted it so that people, the, the count would only start on the day of travel. So that's, here's time zero, all right? And, um, and when you start counting on the day of travel, so this is the amount of exposure that the destination that us are getting from the traveler. And then, so here's the untested, untested traveler and it goes up to there and here's the PCR test the safe travels program and it goes up to 80 percent of the height of the untested curve all right so so really this is where this figure is that the pre-travel test is reducing our exposure to infected travelers only by 20 percent okay not the 36 percent that was reported in the study. Uh, do you have any questions on that so far? I have one, Doc, and it's, does this model, yeah. and it, this is a great question, does this model factor in the travelers who tested positive, but rather than cancel their trip, got on the plane and say they didn't test, they're not vaccinated, and they come here anyway, uh, saying they're going to be quarantining, but they don't. Could that be the reason why you saw that little oh. uptick? when it shouldn't have been with the five-day quarantine? Uh, well, that that's a good theory, but that's not the problem with the, the, the study. But that, I mean, you raise a very important practical question, which is what if people um, just, uh, you know, what if people aren't being cooperative? So, and, they, and they're lying about quarantine. So I don't know what the estimations are about how much that happens. But this, so actually in, in some of the, uh, in, in this Lancet study, they do uh, assume that there's like 20% uh, defection from the quarantine in calculating it. So they already factor that in to some degree. Okay. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah. All right. All right. So now let's look what, let's look at the, um, the comparison of the PCR test with with the PCR test plus the quarantine. So now what I did is I took those two curves and I lay them on top of each other and lo and behold, they're identical up until day five. And then they start to split. So this is a problem. This doesn't make sense. Why is the exposure during these five days of quarantine contributing? Why is it being counted at all? It, there shouldn't, shouldn't be counted at all. So, these were two problems that I saw with what the paper was reporting in terms of how much exposure are we in Hawaii getting from infected travelers in terms of measuring that. So I wrote up a letter and I sent it into the journal to the Lancet Infectious Diseases to the editor. And the editor um, read it and understood the, the reasoning and it all made sense. And so they decided to publish it and they sent it to the authors of the original study and then let the authors uh, 
compose a reply. And so what, what happened is they actually, the authors re-ran their simulations and they acknowledged that this was a mistake, that they shouldn't have been counting the exposure during this quarantine period. And when they, when they don't do that, well, I'll show you what happens here. Um, so here I took their curve and I assumed that you wouldn't get, I took the, the this is the quarantine curve and I shifted it so that there wouldn't be any exposure during the period of quarantine. And we get only about 17% of the exposure instead of what they found, 30%. And so when we do these corrections to using their graphs, we get that here's no testing at 100% of exposure. The safe travels pre-test gets you down to 80%, but the five-day quarantine in the second 15%. So this is a, this is an 83% reduction. And when the authors redid, they found very close to this. They they found the 80% and then they found actually it was a little lower, 16% exposure. So that was the, their, my, my letter and their reply to my letter was what was just published in the past week. And, uh, and, and the reason that the, um, that the news media did this story. So, um, so I think this is it's important that the people of Hawaii and the policymakers be in on this latest science. OK, now this is all before Delta and before vaccination. So really, they need to redo these simulations. But I think these give a general idea of how much protection we're getting uh, from the current safe travels and how much protection we could be getting if more measures were added after arrival. So. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Oh, let me, uh, let's see. One other thing I calculated from their graphics was how much would a seven day visitor uh, expose us to? Because actually I think nine days is like the average duration of a, vi of a tourist's visit. And you can see that the, the ex total exposure is not getting as high. And so here's the safe travels graph and so that it gets up to about 73 percent of what an untested traveler would be giving us so that's about a 27 percent reduction which is more than 20 percent but it's um but it's a lot less than 90 percent and if we compare the amount of exposure from a seven-day traveler compared to a two-week traveler or this would be also a returning resident it's about 60 percent so when people are here for a shorter period of time they're not exposing us as much as a returning resident or somebody who stays here for a full 14 days. So I think that's um, that's all the graphics I wanted to show. So I can return, you can return the screen uh, or unless, well, we could leave it up uh, in case there's any questions. Um, uh, there, you know, we did have one question. It was me. about, yeah, we had one question and it was about Delta um, and you answered that. I did want to welcome Senate President Ron Kochi is actually on here watching this doc. So, um, yeah, we got uh, we got Senate President on. So I'm hoping I'm hoping that he oh, caught I'm the I'm hoping that he caught the um, the actual presentation. But uh, we can make that available to him uh, at this point. Uh, I mean, I mean, you can watch this. But let me. Uh, I did want to go up and put that other video real quick it's a short video yes but i so yeah I so this is um, the video so this is the news this is the news coverage that just came out yesterday uh from hawaii news now uh covering the the, the letter and um, the author's response okay we're, okay here it is right here okay there's a couple of buttons i gotta push here boom boom and then Boom. Questions of the entire pandemic. How many travelers 
are unknowingly arriving in Hawaii carrying the coronavirus. It's more than you might think. According to a new study, scientists believe Hawaii's pre-travel testing program is likely catching only 20% of infected travelers. Could this lead to changes in Hawaii's policy? Our Mahea Lani Richardson joins us now with the new information tonight. Mahea? Well, Stefan Kiahi, the study's authors from Stanford University and UC San Francisco say they're worried about gaps in Hawaii's travel testing. Break through infections for those who are vaccinated and say routine asymptomatic testing is one of the biggest missed opportunities. It misses people that are infected. UH adjunct professor Lee Altenberg wrote a letter to the Lancet, which was then published updating the original study, which did not include the Delta variants and vaccinations. Altenberg says the virus can leak through testing, especially now with the Delta variant, and that Hawaii Safe Travel's pre-testing protocol may be detecting only 20% of infected travelers. So that's the simplified way of putting it. The precise way of putting it is that the total of exposure of the destination population, namely the residents of Hawaii, from COVID-infected travelers is reduced by the pre-travel test by about 20 percent compared to if there was no test and no quarantine. He believes everyone flying in should be tested regardless of vaccination status. When they also tested a strategy where you add a quarantine of five days and a second test to get out of it, they found that that strategy reduced the exposure by 84 percent. Altenberg says tourists are not the main source of infection, but do contribute to it. How much, nobody knows. Studies do show they've got little incentive to test while on vacation. If they test positive, it ruins their whole vacation. This virus is, is mutating kind of in front of our eyes. Dr. Dara O'Carroll, an emergency physician, believes data shows pre-travel testing needs to be beefed up to keep the economy going. If Hawaii is going to and continue and needs to be reliant on travel, we need to really take a hard look at what the actual science is saying rather than, you know, keeping our heads in the sand. Now, Governor Ige's office says there are no changes planned to Hawaii's safe travels program at this time. But in the past, he has noted that the CDC said fully vaccinated people can fly safely, so it would be hard to force them to be tested. Mahia Lani Richardson, Hawaii News Now. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, that that last comment, and, I, and I'm glad the Senate president is on, but um, that last comment about the governor saying that the CDC talked about it's okay to travel without a without a test if you're if you're vaccinated. We went down that road. We 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 clarified that the the CDC has said unless the state, local, or territorial governments require in quarantine or stay at home orders. I get irritated when the governor or any other elected official brings that up because it's simply not true. And I don't care what our attorney general says, it, it is not true. And they keep using that. And again, the governor saying he has no plans after seeing the study, seeing your uh, the addendum and, and the corrections, I think is, is, is really an insult, but also very, very, very irresponsible. I sorry. I that just pissed me off. I'm I'm sorry, Doc. I, I mean yeah. that's just how that's just so, how I uh, feel. Well, you know, there's in any situation there's ambiguities and there you know, you call it wiggle room. And uh oh. His, um, I think he just lost his signal. He just, <laughs> Charlie. He he just, I can I can see on my on my dashboard. I can see the Wi-Fi strength, and his just went off. So I'm hoping that he can uh, let me let me shoot him a message. But Charlie, what's your thoughts, Charlie? Well, it's quite obvious that uh, when when you. You know, it's it's easy for the governor to side with the CDC. And yet, back in March, the Lancet Journal 
the lieutenant governor was so hep on following that as sort of its um, validation, sort of say. And yet now, with the additional information given by Ali and the new findings that's coming out from Lancet, they 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 turn a blind eye. They don't they don't want to do anything. So the the bottom line is this: they've allowed it already, and that's why, with the excuse being that you know we are monitoring the situation, we are monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. They allowed the numbers to get so out of whack that they they can't bring it back into control. There's no way. So the thing is, we have this delayed process, and as the time goes on. Everybody's just getting more angrier and more angrier and more impatient and more impatient. And that's when uh, mistakes start to happen, right? We should, we should be social distancing, using our masks, doing, getting vaccinated. But people are just getting so impatient because they're being put into that situation because of the ineptness by this government, by this uh, state. They've got, they've got the information in front of them. Why not use it? But yet... They will use something for their convenience if it matches up to what they feel uh, they and their other advisors, the direction that they want to go to. But if it goes totally against the grain, there's not going to be any changes. No way. I don't see it coming. Oh. Yeah, you're, you're muted. You're, you're muted. Oh. Uh-oh. I got you on full strength Wi-Fi. Just we cannot hear you. <laughs> I think I think the um, Big Brother is watching, and I think they clipped your wings, Doc. He can hear us. I can see he can hear us. I'm not sure why. I don't know. Hang on, hang on. I'm not sure why. He's gonna try to. Yeah, for some reason, you might have to go out and come back on, Doc. Can you go out and come back on? Time out. <laughs> yeah, take your time out. Yeah, we'll, we'll cover while you 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 call, you, you you go out and uh, we'll cover. Can you, uh, Doc, can you exit out and then come back in? Completely exit out? Oh, his Wi-Fi went out again. Yeah, no, that's why. Okay, anyway, sorry, guys, about that. It's, yeah, his his his, his uh, signal is very, it's like zero. But I, I think he said it. I know there was a question about what was his recommendations, and his recommendation, he said it in his recommendations to the, the leadership was get the post arrival testing that that's critical i think the models that were shown and and published is published it's not just yahoo's it's it's actually science based data that was published by in the journal uh uc berkeley uc san francisco um come on people come on i don't know what to say uh, and and by the way like i said dr darrell car will be on tomorrow night uh, to share his thoughts as well. Yeah, someone said maybe um, you may want to ask him about his headphones. Okay, here we go. Round three. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, now we can hear you. All right, I'm going to sing Nessun Dora. <laughs> well, well, maybe I'll hold that. I don't know if the microphone will do a good yeah. job. Um, so, so I'm Doc. Saying, yeah, Doc. Real quick, were you? I, I believe that you actually testified at the Senate COVID committee hearing. If I'm not mistaken, I could have sworn I. Were you ever invited? I was never invited. Um, some of my colleagues from HIPAM. Uh, oh Bay, yeah, Doctor Chiba went. Yeah, um, I I didn't. maybe we're gonna have to get. Uh, I know Senate presidents on. Hopefully, he can. Uh, get you in front of the committee again because i think this updated information is vital it's important and uh, if we want to start enjoying the benefits of 
of opening up like the lieutenant governor wants us to. I mean, I think it's going to take some effort and some actions, proactive actions by, by our leadership. So, so could I, let me say, I mean, we're in a bind, right? Because our, our economy is totally dependent on tourism. It's easy money, and and we've taken advantage of it, <clears throat> and it's like the like the turtle that has to breathe. You know, we can't we we have the if we cut ourselves off from the rest of the world, we can keep from getting infected by the pandemic. But then we need to breathe and get tourists to come in to keep the economy going. So we need we need like an N95 mask for tourists, which let the the air in. Right, in terms of the tourism economy, but keep the virus out. And so the, you know, it was proposed that the pre-travel test was that N95 mask, but it turns out to be more like a gator, right? And not blocking the, the infected tourists. So we, we need something more effective that's, that's free breathing, all right? Just like a good N95 mask. And so what's that gonna be? Well, quarantine is what kept everybody away. So you have to somehow keep the virus out, but not quarantine people. And so what's the best technology that we have available for that right now is the rapid test. And so if travelers had to take a rapid test every morning for their first week uh, before going out, uh, then you'd catch people when they became contagious. And then you could really prevent, uh, you know, you could have this like 84 uh, percent prevention of exposure of Hawaii residents to incoming uh, COVID infected people. And so I, that's, I think would be the least disruptive, the best mm -hmm. for allowing the tourist industry to proceed and the most effective at keeping us from getting infected by tourists. But you know what I find out as, as, as I guess the problem, and it, it has to do with the mechanism. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you the reason why. It's because like, say with this uh, vaccination, Hard, right to go into restaurants in order for that to happen even the restaurants now are pushing back this because they're saying why do we have to enforce it right mm. nobody wants to be in a position so you bring up a good point doc we're sort of in this you know the jelly of it all and which way do we go do we go to the surface or do we go side to side we that part i don't know what the answer is maybe you do but i i think it's it's hard for both sides to grasp on it because we, we just want the best and sometimes there's sacrifices to be made and so i guess how the pendulum swings is how much sacrificing are you willing to make and and, and that seems to be the dilemma right there well i would i would have put in some kind of a stronger measures for the hospitals filling up as as high as they did or much earlier mm -hmm. Um, so the previous stay-at-home order, it was two weeks, or it wasn't two and a half months like the first one, it was two weeks. So and that's the amount of time it would take to recover from a hurricane uh, and before business got back to usual. Anyway, that brought down, cut down the reproduction number by 50%, right? And so that is, um, and the numbers were halved, they were cut in half in like nine days. Mm. And so that was very effective. And then, you know, it ended and the numbers didn't come back up. They stayed down. So that if you want to get quickly, bring the numbers down a what was called the safer at home, uh, it worked really well. Now, I, I like um, I like Mayor Victorino's title for his modification of that, which is safer outside. Right. Because um, outside there there's much, much lower uh, transmission of COVID than there is in, inside because it can't build up aerosol. If you're close to somebody and their breath gets to you before dispersing, yeah, you can get infected outside, but it's still that it's a smaller chance. So, um, and one of the ideas of Hale Hawaii, the group, uh, the Maui group was that uh, arrivals be quarantined to the outdoors for the first like three days after arrival. And so, you know, I'm afraid I have to confess the logistics of doing that. I'm pretty ignorant of, and I'm not very helpful in thinking about. Uh, mm. So, you know, I'm a modeler. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm a modeler. Uh, and, uh, and it was, you know, basically 
looking at the, the figures and the math not making sense that made me write that letter to the Lancet. So, um, so the logistics of any of these measures, I'm afraid I can't be too helpful here. But the problem is when you say the pretest is, is stopping 90% of any case, you cut off discussion, you cut off exploration of alternatives and investigation of other alternatives. And, and so we, we don't have anything ready to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we had said, all right, this is, this is uh, what we're doing for the moment, but it's not good enough and we're going to try to keep improving on it, then you put resources into coming up with a better plan. Uh, now, one of, it's interesting. One of the rapid home, rapid home tests, you have to connect uh, on a smartphone to get the result. And so that's the Elune test. So it's much, it's much more expensive, but it's, a, it's an enforceable way of doing it. Uh, because you have to upload your results to, to uh, the server, and then they can contact them, the health authorities. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of one logistic solution. Well, I think your <clears throat> your suggestion of the daily rapid tests for five. I mean, I, I we talked about this a while back. I suggested four days, but five days, seven, whatever it is. If we Those require. If we require the daily testing on of our of our visitors, travelers, anybody, even residents coming home, every day you you know, and it's not that expensive anymore. I'm not talking about the the one you hook up to the network, but just a plain rapid test. Uh, you don't get your key back to your room unless you test. Mm. And if you happen to test positive, your your contact tracing is minimal because you sh you you were negative yesterday so you have 24 hours of contact tracing that you got to deal with it makes sense and you know uh, it's, uh, what these tests I, I think dr o'carroll or someone said these tests now you know probably 10 bucks a piece if you buy them in bulk and and you know so it, you add that to the hotel room uh and for our local residents the government should pay we, we're giving these tests away my point is this, is we got to do something, but you, you hit it on the head when you say, when you come out and say it's 90% effective, you stop the discussion. But even we, even though we know that number was not accurate from the beginning, uh, it was very clear because once you stop the travel, the cases dropped. Once you opened up, the cases rose. It's, it's, you don't need to be a, a scientist to see that. Uh, here's a question, Doc, that came in. Ask Dr. Lee Altenberg if the data coincides with other findings from studies like Maui's airport departure testing study after travel open widely. All right, that's a great question. So, you know, if you if you're also trying to make sense of all this, all right, you I'm sure you've heard the, the statements in the travel industry talking about you know that the tourists are not the problem. That only like one percent or two percent of tourists are among the positive cases. Right. So how does that fit with this with this data that the pre-travel test is only reducing the exposure by 20 percent? So here, the crucial factor is that there's a conflict of interest in getting tested if you're a tourist that you don't have if you're a returning resident. All right. If you if you're a returning resident and you you're worried that you might have COVID and you get tested, well, you have to stay home. It's not that big a deal. If you're a tourist and you get tested and it's positive, you're stuck here for 10 days in a very expensive lodging and you're, you're unable to leave the lodging and, and enjoy your whole purpose of having a vacation here. So that's a really different context for getting tested between tourists and returning residents. So the question is how, how much of an effect is that? And unfortunately, the Department of Health doesn't have any data on that, but we do have two data points. And one of them was the Maui departure study you mentioned. And the other was the, the safe travel study by uh, DeWolf Miller, who is an epidemiologist. So in that study, they, um, they looked at two sets of data. One was the big island, Hawaii, which was testing everybody, uh, giving a second test upon arrival at the airport. Everybody had to do that. And there they found it was like one out of a thousand were testing positive. But they also did another portion of a test where um, they asked people to volunteer and to test four days after they arrived. And 
So in that case, of all the people they invited, only 10% volunteered to get tested <laughs> on the fourth day of their trip, all right? And, but among those who did get tested, they were seven in a thousand, seven positives in a thousand tests. So seven times as high a rate of testing positive. And that is consistent with the Lancet paper. If you remember that curve after, after the pre-travel test, the exposure curve stays flat um, for like four, almost you know, three or four days. It's almost flat. And so if you test them right at the airport, the chance that you're gonna have a positive of somebody who was negative just two or three days before is really, really small. And so that is indeed consistent with the, with the Miller study where they found at the second test at the airport on Big Island, almost no uh, positives, one in a, a thousand. But then four days later, that's when everybody is becoming contagious when they've been infected. And there they found seven out of a thousand positives. All right, so that was the, the Miller study. Now the, the De Maui departure study, what they did is they invited people to take this test when they were at the airport, just about to get on their airplane with no negative consequences. All right, so in the Miller study, if you tested positive, you had to quarantine on your, your vacation. In the departure study, if you test positive, you're already home before you even get the result. And there's no consequences at all. In fact, they didn't even report it to health authorities and they got, um, they got uh, criticism for that. But this is very important uh, to get this data, this information. But there they found that of the people they invited to take this test, 72% said yes, all right? So people, only 10% of, of tourists in the middle of their trip uh, um, decided to get tested, whereas 77, 72% on their way home just before the, getting on the plane decided. So that's the one piece of data we have in, in terms of how much of a disincentive it is for tourists to get tested, that it looks like um, there's really uh, only about one seventh of the tourists would be getting tested who would be uh, if they were uh, returning residents. So when you see a 1% of the, of the positive cases are tourists, the best, uh, the best estimate we have is to multiply that by seven, all right? So that would be 7% of, or you know, when you see a 2% number, well, that's like 14%. And those are comparable to the positive cases from returning residents, if I, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. So I think, um, so those two studies together give us an estimate of how much we're missing uh, from, from knowing what tourists are bringing in compared to returning residents. Yeah, I know <clears throat> Maui, Maui had a little incentive for those guys leaving. A uh, couple of things. Number one, they knew it was anonymous. They knew that it was, they, I mean, no, they would not be kept behind. And, number, and then they were also giving given some goodie bags uh, to take back with them. So, but, but, you know, initially when I heard that, I thought it was pretty foolish because you're going to let these people get on a plane there that are potentially positive. But the, the reality is they would have traveled anyway. And, and this at least gave us some numbers so we could start making some decisions, which it, at the end of the day, we never made it, it. We just didn't, you know, we never changed much. In fact, we became more accessible to uh to travel so I, I hope doc that you know people will take your information seriously lance said i know someone said for one scientist on in hawaii to change or have the authors of a study like the landsat study change their study it's it's a huge thing it's it's a big thing and uh much much appreciation to you for doing that we know uh, that brings up something that I really wanted to touch on, which is the, the process of science, okay? So science isn't like a bunch of facts that are just uh, there, tr eternal truths waiting to be discovered. It's a process of, of discovery and of finding errors and correcting errors, all right? So um, so here's this, this study in this extremely prestigious journal, and they send it out to reviewers whose job is to pick through it and find any problems and any errors and get them corrected before publication. And so 
obviously the, you know, the authors don't want to make a mistake. Um, the, the authors, uh, they want to have everything accurate. Um, you know, I hate many, making mistakes myself in my papers and I do everything I can to prevent them um, from getting published and just to correct them before I send them out. Um, but you know, nobody's perfect. So here's a problem that the reviewers, the authors missed, the reviewers missed, the editor missed, but when I was digging into it, I managed to catch. So what happens next is the journal has a process where people can send in letters about what they've published after they're published and they'll look at the letter and if it looks um, important or enough uh, to publish, they will do that. And then the authors have a chance to respond. So this is how science works, all right? Nobody's perfect. Pe despite people's best efforts, you can make mistakes, but it's a process of finding mistakes and correcting mistakes. And so in this case, the process worked, all right? So the journal accepted my letter, the, the the authors realized what I said was true and they confirmed it in their reply and they actually reran their simulations to get the correct numbers um, and and that's now in the current version of the paper. So, you know, for somebody who's, I mean, and the problem is this pandemic has forced us to rely on science to get through it because suddenly our whole reality has changed, all right? Um, you know, normally in your day-to-day -day life, you don't endanger people's lives, right? So what, you know, what's the, the only common circumstance where you can be endangering somebody's life is pretty much is when you're driving, all right? So suddenly just being with somebody, sitting in a room with them is as dangerous as driving on the freeway, all right? This is complete radical change in our, in our, the rules of day-to-day -day life. And driving is heavily regulated because it has so much uh, danger in it. Uh, you have to be licensed to drive. The, the streets, the driving behavior is all regulated and uh, enforced. And now we have that same amount of danger just by hanging out with each other uh, you know, at a restaurant. So this is a, a radical change in our relationships with one another. And to try to navigate through this change, we we are, science is our best tool. And so it's important, especially with people that think that the vaccines are dangerous, that masks don't work, is to turn to the science, the scientific process, and to realize that uh, it's a process of detecting errors and correcting errors. And uh, in this case, the process, uh, I think, worked. Real quick question. I know we're, we're up past the eight o'clock hour. Um, is there a correlation in your opinion between the lesser number of cases right now and the drop in visit arrivals that we're currently experiencing? So, you know, correlation doesn't prove causation. And you have to get much deeper in the weeds to figure out if, if that is the cause or not. So, I mean, it, it potentially is. So one thing to realize is, you know, even if you reach herd immunity, and the cases are dropping right now. Actually, um, you wanted me to, to talk about the numbers, right? And I had a, I had a graph to show about that. Um, can I share that? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, let, let's hope I can speak afterwards. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you see? Can you see the graph? Yep. Okay, so this is for August and September. And the blue is the actual, is the seven day running average of our case numbers. And the orange is fitting an exponential growth curve to it, or in this case, exponential decline. And so from August 1st to well, about August uh, 20th, we were in this exponential growth phase where the doubling time was 31 days, all right? So if we'd kept at that rate, then by now, instead of 900 cases, there'd be 1800 cases, all right? But we didn't keep at that rate. Now what the exact causes are, that needs to be determined. But then in this second half of, of, the, of the graph, the past um, three weeks, we've been, the cases have been declining at a rate of about 22 days cutting in half. 
So this would mean in three weeks from now, we would have half the case numbers that we have today. So they'd be somewhere above 200 if this kept up. And in terms of the reproduction number of the virus, in terms of how many people a single infected person is infecting, it was about 1.12 in August, which is a big drop from what it was in July. But now it's, it's under, it's 0.85, all right? And um, so that, uh, that means one infected person is only infecting on the average 0.85 other people. But the problem is even if, so this is, if this kept up, we, we would be at herd immunity, all right? If, if we could maintain this. And the thing is, if, you're, if you have this reproduction number, then um, tourists coming in, 100 tourists, infected tourists would infect 85 residents, all right? And those 85 residents would go on to infect maybe 60 residents, and those 60 would infect 50, and all of this would be community spread. It wouldn't be counted as travel associated. And when you add it all up, um, those 100 infected tourists would probably have caused like uh, 600 cases of community spread. All right. So this is an important part of the, the math of herd immunity is that if infected tourists or infected travelers of any sort keep streaming in, even if you've reached the herd immunity threshold in your own community, you're still going to have um, most of your cases are going to be um, community spread, and they're going to be all caused by infected travelers coming in. So without those infected travelers, the cases will go to zero. So this is why it's important, even if we get to the herd immunity threshold, if there's a world of infected people out there, we need to stop that infection from coming into the state. Right, your 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 point eight five, your eighty five hundredths of a of a number. The having the twenty two having the half day, whenever it takes twenty two days to yeah. half the the numbers. That's assuming that it's a closed community, that there's no additional exactly. virus coming in, uh, no exactly. and viruses leaving. That that's okay. That's a that's a that's a point in time estimate uh, that is based on a on a population that's not that is not growing with infection. And I, I think that's where a lot of people, you know, <clears throat> we always talk about that on the show. We're counting a lot of virus cases, a lot of COVID cases as community spread, which is probably the te technically correct. But the bottom line is the origin was not from the community. It was, it was, it came in off of an aircraft from a returning resident or a visitor. Exactly. Wow. So if, if we'd had like the, the if we were if we'd had the 84 percent reduction in exposure that uh, the, the rapid testing after arrival would have given us um the delta variant probably still would have gotten here because even the very best countries in the world like australia and new zealand that had that had achieved zero covid the delta variant penetrated it and now it's causing a major struggle for them to control it so the Delta variant would have gotten here no matter what, but it would have gotten here later and it would have gotten here in much smaller numbers. And I think our, our total case numbers would have been much lower if we'd been blocking its import uh, through travelers. Well, well Doc, that, um, that was a quick hour. Uh, I, I don't know how much how, how much more we can say uh, besides thank you. I mean, we appreciate you spending your time with us. I, I think our viewers got a treat tonight. We talked about it earlier, how we, we get to hear you for a couple of minutes on the news. But tonight we got to hear, hear and see um, a lot of valuable information. So any any closing thoughts before we, we, we let you go tonight? Well, so, what, so what's going to happen next? You know, what do we need to do next? Um, so it looks like the crisis in the hospitals has been has been um, reduced, and so what's you know what's coming up for the long for the long haul? Well, the Delta variant is so contagious that it's going to basically if if people are not sheltered at home and they're unvaccinated, they're at really high risk. Okay, and so I, I urge everyone to get vaccinated. All right, it's it's not risk free, but it's the best way to reduce your risk. Okay, um, 
that we have available. And um, what we have on, in the, the longer term, the problem is it's the, the Delta variant is raging through the world and millions and millions of people are getting infected and every one of them is like a, a, a genetic engineering laboratory for the coronavirus to come up with a new variant. Right, so when you get infected, you're you're now a laboratory for the coronavirus to try to find a new variant that's going to be worse, and that whole world is going to be producing something, and and we need to have ways of keeping a real bad boy variant out, what if we need to, and that's why I think looking forward, we have to pay attention to our travel policy. Yeah, I, I can I can remember back when Delta was popping up in other countries and then it showed up in in the United in our country in the, in the continent. Um, many of our leaders came out publicly and said we didn't have to worry about it. Uh, same things they're saying about Lambda and Mu and all of that. We don't know what's coming, and if we don't shore up our borders, our our coasts, our airports, uh, you know, we we can we can have another Delta that's worse than this one. And and I think that's kind of the the, the fear I have. Well, we'll see. I well, appreciate you, Doc. Charlie. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Doc. Go ahead. Well, just uh, I mean, this, the pandemic is showing the fissures and fault lines in our society and in individuals. And you know, I think it's really what's really important is that the our leadership get the get the science out before the people. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that um, that this information about the the Lancet study will become common knowledge and and be discussed by the leadership in Hawaii so that we can make plans based on the solid science. Sounds good, my friend. Thank you again. Charles. You know, I, I just got a few words, and that is, I'm just afraid this administration, you're going to have a missed opportunity like they did the first time, right? They got really complacent, and they let things go, and then everybody went into the OS syndrome after that. Because why? It just got out of control. So I'm just afraid that they, they, they're going to do it again. And, you know, I, I do want to give a shout out to a couple of my friends here. We all worked on at the airport. You know, if, you, if, if we see what's going on now, people really have to understand this and really have to take the time. But, again, what's plaguing us is just the level of impatience. And I say that because look what happened on the, the flight coming from Honolulu to Hilo today. You know, for no reason, uh, uh, a flight attendant gets clocked by a, by a passenger for no reason. Today, one of the uh, personnel at the airport got challenged about uh, is the mask mandate a law? when that person was told to put on their mask. You see, things like this are happening. And so it kind of like, it, it gets away from the real root of the problem. And that is, we are trying to stay safe. And a lot of these people are trying to make a point that they have their freedoms. What's the compromise to it all? Get your freedoms and get sick? Or just trying to stay safe? I know what I want. I don't know about the others. So I think if anybody's out there listening, you know, we got to come to some kind of resolution on this thing. And it may not be as fast as you want it to be, but I, I can almost assure you this administration, they have the evidence in front of them. They will just not want to dabble in it because it's going to affect a lot of the promises that they made. And also remember this, folks, accountability. We're accountable for our actions. It's funny that these politicians who we elect, they're not held accountable to us. Just remember that. No? Roger, Dodger, Charlie, thank you very much. Hey, um, yeah, they've had, our leaders have had this information for quite a while now. They just choose to ignore it because it, it does, it does, go against the grain with their agendas. So uh, I know a lot of you guys, first of all, Doc, thanks again for joining us, man. I get tickled every time you come on. And then uh, tomorrow night we have Dr. O'Carroll as the, as the, as the, I mean, it's just another dose of reality. 
uh, just appreciate you folks. Uh, for those of you watching and, and wondering how you can help, like I said, a lot of people got a chance to see a couple of minutes of Dr. Altenberg on the news mm -hmm. uh, in the past week. Tonight, you got an hour, a little over an hour with real data. So how, how can you help? Share the crap out of these videos, whether it's on Facebook, YouTube, we're on Twitter, we're on all the social media platforms. It's very simple for you to hit the share button on any of those platforms and get it in front as many people as possible. Informing and educating is what we do. Okay, I got the timer. I think that was my, I don't know what that was, but something just there. Oh my God, there it is again. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Um, that's telling me that my apple pie in the oven is done. So oh, say. okay, okay. <laughs> Woo. I was like, what the heck? Anyway, that's Charlie's way of saying, no, enough. You, you're talking too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, bottom line, guys, th listen, we, we are not out of the woods. Dr. Char admitted that on her, her, her thing the other day. We, we are not out of the woods. So please share this thing with everybody that you know, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, however you can. Just share it. Let everybody know the facts. So when they hear the rubbish on the news, they, they can automatically tune that out and, and keep focus on what's really happening out there. We want to keep everybody safe. We want to. We don't want to lose any more people. Uh, we're losing way too many people right now, and all all majority of these cases could have been prevented. So, Doc, thank you very much. We look to have you back on uh, as things progress in a positive way. Yeah. Um, and to our viewers again, you guys are the best. We appreciate you guys. Tomorrow night, seven o'clock, Doctor Dara O'Carroll. You guys all have a wonderful evening. You take care. God bless. Thank you. Aloha.